Hello, everybody. This is Jimmy Beach with Exposure Software. Welcome to this demonstration about editing images in Exposure. In the lesson, we're going to quickly go through the whole process of editing. Our goal is that you'll have a clear understanding of how Exposure operates by the end. Now, before I get going with the lesson, I always do just a little bit of a mic check. So if somebody could um, pipe up in the chat or the Q&A or something like that, um, just to let me know if everything sounds great, because I'd hate to record this and no one be able to hear me. So I will uh, go into our little bit of a history lesson while I wait for you guys to um, let me know if you can hear what I'm talking about. And let's say, okay, for about 15 years ago, uh, exposure was created for film photographers and um, the transition between working with chemicals in the darkroom and working with a um, working with digital files um, all excuse me just a second as I set something to not bother me again okay sorry and then working with the digital process was completely new to them they were used to you know dunking pieces of paper inside of chemistry so uh, that transition to working with uh, digital cameras was tough for them to make and exposures uh, film emulation presets the giant library of presets that is kind of what exposure began as is where it got its start and that was exactly what they needed at the time to help bridge that gap thank you everybody for piping up including uh nate who um is super awesome and i left his notifications on so you may have heard the beep while i was talking anyway um before we go any further in the demo i do want to point out that there is time at the end reserved for answering any specific questions that you have but if there is something that you think of, go ahead and ask it. And uh, if I don't address it in the demonstration, I'll make, I'll make sure to address it as soon as I possibly can. So first things first is that Exposure does a number of things. It edits images and it also enables you to organize images. Now, as we begin in our workflow in Exposure, typically we need to copy our images probably from a camera card or maybe an external hard drive, like you plugged in an, uh, an archive drive and you just wanna copy some images over there to do some processing, that's what you'd do. So let us begin. Typically when you plug a camera card into the computer, it opens this dialog, the copy photos from card dialog. Excuse me. Okay, and this is very simple. We'll follow it along very quickly here. Uh, in the copy from card dialog, we have three numbers at the top. The numbered sections are each one of the main steps that you have in the workflow. And then as you go through this, then you get OK at the end and it begins to download or ingest those images for you. So I will select the camera card that I have selected here or that I have plugged in here. And it will begin to give me some thumbnail images of what is on that card. Now, if you don't always just work from a camera card. Yes, you can have an external, like an archive plugged in right here. And if you did that, you would then select the images and copy them in this much the same way that we're doing right here from a camera card. And even though that might seem a little strange to be copying them from an archive, that does ensure that you don't oversave any or damage any of those files in that archive. So that is a workflow option for you. So that is what we do here in the select source um, section. Now the next section is where we review images and select which ones we want to download or copy. Now I have all of them selected here. So there are some other options. You can shrink or grow the thumbnail images or you can um, check or uncheck all things like that. Also, if you don't clear your cards out between shooting, you have the option to only uh, show new files that you haven't downloaded or that you, yeah, that you haven't downloaded already. And then on the on the uh, right side here are the destination and options. And that's where we tell Exposure where we want to copy these images onto the computer. And that would be in, you can see right here, I can, I can select the standard location and copy them directly to the desktop. Or like I've been doing, I'll select another folder and then it will give me an option. And I can say on my desktop, I want to put it in my photos folder where you can see I have a bunch of photo folders already. 
Now in that photos folder, you can see it says generate subfolders. That just quickly enables me to move my images into subfolders so I don't have to think about it. And these are from John Barclay. Now, we can also make backup copies of them automatically if we have another drive that we work with, or we can convert them to raw, or I mean, sorry, you can convert them to DNG from raw. Uh, we can also rename our files here if we want to while we're transferring them, if we have a naming convention that we typically use. And we can add metadata, which gives us uh, additional information about categorizing and organizing them. Uh, as well as copywriting them. And um, you can actually have options here to add to collections so we can organize them straight away. We can put keywords onto those images too, or we can even put um, some of exposures or some of your favorite presets from exposure onto those images directly as uh, they are copied to the computer. I'm not gonna do any of that for the demo, but that is some options just to get you a quick start when you're starting to move things over to your machine. Now I'm gonna click OK really quick here. And we can see that it says copying files. Now it does it pretty fast because uh, I have a USB 3.0. That's what I'm running off of right now, which is a pretty fast connection. But I did wanna say that while that um, progress bar was up here, exposure enables me to begin working immediately, such as marking uh, which ones of these images I want as my favorites or uh, applying flags or any of the other organization stuff that we would like to, or even editing, you can do that while images are being copied. So imagine a uh, works or case scenario would be that you have thousands of images and you're moving all of them over from a drive or something like that. And it's processing in the background. You can even organize and do that as it's, as it's copying. Okay. Now, Let's, the OneDrive question is pretty specific, Gillies. I do see that. I'll get to that um, in, in a bit. Let me continue with my demo here. Okay. So we'll talk about what we can do to these images after we have them copied to our machine. Okay, so I did say that Exposure doesn't use any uh, catalog, I think. If I didn't, hey, Exposure doesn't use a catalog. What I mean is, uh, instead of having a catalog, um, or, or a module, yeah, catalog is the right word I'm looking for. Instead of having a catalog, all of the edits and things that you do inside of Exposure are actually saved in sidecar files. Here is exhibit A. We can see we have the desktop. That's my folder that I'm looking in on my hard drive in the photos folder. And then I have all of my folder, folders right in here with all of the images from these photographers. Now, if I look inside of Exposure, just to compare, I'm doing the same exact thing. We have the same folder structure as our hard drive, so we don't have any weird surprises and we don't know where things are. Inside of these folders are where our catalog stuff lives. That's right here. It's in the sidecar file. So any edits that I make, any organization uh, things that I apply, anything like that inside of Exposure are just going to live right here inside of the sidecar file. That means that it makes it really easy to do things like backups and archives or even sharing photos with other people that are edited. You can just simply grab a hold of the whole folder because all of that information is contained within it and drag and drop it over to share, you know, if you wanted to whoop, move it over to the cloud or something. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this does a number of things for you. It makes it a little bit quicker. Um, it also makes it so that, um, all your commands are available all the time and uh, it's a little more efficient too. So now that we have our images copied, let's talk about how we can organize them really quick with the tools inside of Exposure. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna point out is that we are in the wrong workspace. So I wanna go to the calling workspace and that's the workspace where I would be uh, calling or editing down the shoot to find the very best in the, um, in the lot. Okay, imagine we have thousands of photos and we wanna go through quickly to be able to organize them. Here's how we're gonna start. The first way I would suggest doing this, let's shut this side. Here's where I have to look through all that information. That's a little bit too much on the screen. And we can see that we are in John Barclay's folder right now. So I'm just gonna do a couple of quick things so that we can see as there's only 30 images here, it'll be 
uh, pretty painless. I can uh, apply flags, which would be like uh, a pick flag saying, yes, I definitely want to use that image or a reject flag saying, no, I definitely don't want to reject that image. I'll show you that again, just, just a sec. And, or you can shut the, um, or you can not flag and that's the empty one. You can see it down here on the bottom panel. Now, when I go to switch through my different uh, workspaces, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. I'll show that demo because I know I moved really fast there. Down in the lower right-hand corner, there's a menu and you can select between your workspaces that you have here in the menu. Another way that you can do it is you can access it from the quick menu right here. If you just hover over the edge, and then you can select your workspaces there. So I'm in the culling workflow or workspace right now. If I do anything that's a little bit confusing to you, I'll point out now that you can find help from the help menu. There's a bunch of uh, links here or so that you can open up some tutorials on our website that talk specifically about things inside of Exposure. Also some keyboard shortcuts, which I'm going to mention very soon in uh, the workflow here because they make things super fast. You can also check for updates to make sure that you have the latest version of Exposure on your computer. And there's a link to the manual, which has pretty much everything written down one step at a time, which happens inside of Exposure. Now, we're back to where we were. Speaking of keyboard shortcuts, I started with saying that we have flags here along the bottom. The flags are also found inside of the UI here on the left-hand side. So if I left-click, it'll apply a flag. Or if I left-click again, it'll apply a reject flag. If I apply one more time, it erases the flag. You can right-click and choose from the menu here. And remember when I said shortcuts? Here they come. Plus assigns a pick flag. Minus a reject flag. And whatever flag it is, if you... Uh, apply the same flag, it will mark it back to neutral, okay? So I know we have a grid of images. So what we want to do is pick between these photos really, really fast. And that's what keyboard shortcuts are all about. So plus and minus, okay? So I can just use the keyboard and the arrow keys on the keyboard to tell me which ones I want to choose, which ones I don't want to choose. And, I don't, and uh, we can go through this really fast to do that, right? Let's talk about um, maybe making that even a little faster because I have to, you know, push the arrow button. Then I have to click the plus or minus. Then I have to go to the next one with the next arrow key. If I hold shift, I can do the same kind of application of these without having to do that um, arrow key button, which makes it a lot more quick when it comes to you having to make decisions and you don't have to move your um, hand to do two different places on the keyboard to do something. So it does pick things up a very, very uh, quick amount. So let's see what we can do here. We did all of our flag ratings really quick, okay? So we're organizing these so we can fi fix which ones or pick which ones are the best ones. If we apply a filter right here at the bottom, then we can see which of those we said that we want to pick, right? So we quickly went from 30 to 19. You know, and the goal here is that we only pick which ones we want to edit uh, rather than editing all of them, because that's a lot of work that we might not necessarily use. All right. So we talked about the uh, pick and reject flags. We can also see down here on the bottom that we have star ratings and we have these color blocks. OK, star ratings, you can see here inside the UI right here in the center. That's where you can apply them or you can use the numbers. I'm gonna let you guess which number does what in terms of which, how many star ratings to apply. Just kidding, uh, one through five on the keyboard. So we'll apply, it's the same rules that applied to when we were doing the pick and reject flags. We're gonna hold down the shift button when we apply things. That way we don't have to go to the arrow button to uh, cycle to the next one in the sequence, okay? So I'm gonna hold shift and that enables me to apply a, um, a bunch of these right in a row, okay? Now, 
I went through that pretty blazingly quick, which is one of the great things about organizing an exposure. So now I can set a flag so that, or so I can set a um, filter, which we start to narrow these down again. So I only want to have anything that I said that was over three stars, I'll put right there. So we necked it down a little bit more. Now we can use our key or our color labels here to do the same types of things. Now you can use them however you want to in your workflow. That's really up to you, but they are things that make it a lot quicker to um, narrow down on what type of image you're looking for if it is a type of image that you're using here. So, you know, if it has a photo of a person and then I can mark it a certain color, like green and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then when I come to my folder, if I wanna quickly look through whatever it is, I can say, hey, these ones are landscapes. That one has a red uh, color label, or these are photos of people and they have a green label. So it's a really quick and easy way of getting from a bunch of images down to very few images. Now I know my demo here was pretty quick and rough just to show you the basics of it. But if you go to a folder that has a lot of images like this one from Frank, there's you know over a hundred photos in this um, folder. So if I remove my filter with command O, you can see down here now there's no filter then I have all of these different images to pick through. Whereas if I want to find one specifically, I know that I have some that I've picked before, and these are just with the green label so that I can pick out from those. So it's a really good time saver when you're organizing to use these different tools. Okay, so I did say again that the shortcut keys are available for all the stages in your workflow and that you can find that inside of the manual in the help menu, but I wanted to point that out one more time because they're available there. Okay, so now we're going to get over to processing our images. I think that we've covered what we need to when it comes to the organizing side of things, of the workflow. So we have some cute shots here from Paola Paz. Let's reset our filter, command O, and we can see them in here. Okay. Now, first things first, I know, notice that there are a number of different, I'm gonna shut this side here because we don't need that right now. Okay, so notice in here, we have a number of images and there are different types of images. If you see right here on the top, right? That's a JPEG, that's JPEG, that's JPEG, that's not. Well, let's, um, let's put a filter on here so that we know that we're only getting the images that we want to get. So I'm gonna type NEF, this is a very, handy and practical application of using the metadata search right here in the bottom of the panel. You can see it right here where I typed it in. So that is a filter that will only show me a certain type of file. And so here are all raw images that haven't been edited. And so we can take a look at how we can edit them. Now, remember back in the beginning of uh, exposure, I explained that excuse me, I explained that it's allergy season down here and I'm coughing an awful lot, so I apologize. I explained that we began with, exposure began with creating a library of presets that uh, analog photographers really, really loved because it gave them the look and the feel of traditional films that they worked with back. Now, that now is more of a processing step and I'll show you how to get to that in just a second, okay? So when we go, to, when we think about our editing adjustments, I want you to think about them in two different ways. We, we do them for two things. We do them for correcting an issue in a picture or a photo or for a creative look, okay? So we're gonna divide our workflow in half here and we're gonna do the correcting issues steps first, which is typically what you would do to your images first anyway, you know? What's the saying? You don't put lipstick on a pig or, or something? Hopefully that wasn't an offensive saying. Okay. So the first few things that we do when we're editing images is we think about changing our workspace. <laughs> so I'm going to go down here to the right-hand side on the bottom, and we're going to go to the editing workspace now. So that's going to bring up the panels for what I would typically use when I'm editing. So we have the histogram open here, which is useful to identify which images need some adjustments and which places inside of uh, the tone values. Uh, we can 
we have the folders there, but we don't need them anymore. There are presets over here on the left, but these are looks, right? That's not actually making corrections. So let's talk about corrections. Lens corrections is something that you would start with first. Lens corrections in exposure are automatic or manual. So if uh, the lens, for example, this image that was shot here was using a lens that's not supported by exposure. And so you can choose from a profile of a lens that's similar to what you use to shoot with, or you can add um, manual correction here, right? So whereas this image has a supported lens, you can see that the lens profile is brought up right here at the bottom, and we can choose to use the profile. That's the uh, preloaded profile that exposure has built in here for uh, distortion and vignette correction. And then you can also use the profile for chromatic aberration correction. Or again, you have manual correction as well if you want to do things by hand because, uh, because you have a trained eye for it. Okay. So that's the first type of thing that we would do is lens correction. The next thing to think about is uh, sharpening. So we're going to go to the sharpening panel here. I'm going to zoom in here to 100% when I apply sharpening. That's always a really good idea. When you apply sharpening, you, if you're seeing it from when you're shrunk down at this size, as long as you're not going to ever zoom that image in to look at image detail, that's fine. But remember, we're correcting issues. We're not making a look. So sharpening here, we're just fixing anything. If it looks like it's a little soft when it came out of the uh, camera, or if it looks like there's a little bit of maybe movement or something like that, that we want to sharpen up, we can. So I'll apply it here on the sharpening panel. Now, if you hold down the Alt Option button and uh, use any of these tools, that kind of gives you a little bit of a easier, here, let me move out here so we can see a little bit. That gives you a little preview of what the effects are going to look like. And you can see how that, let me close this. All right. You can see how the radius, as I make it wider, it's saying that now the effects are going to be very wide. Okay, so notice this only goes to five. Okay, so five is not a very wide radius when it comes to applying sharpening. But remember, this is corrective sharpening. So what I'm trying to do here is make sure that all of the little details look just right. On the detail, we can select. As long as we hold down the Alt or Option button again, it's supposed to turn black and white for me, but it's not. Oh, no, no, that's the amount slider. I lied. See, it's black and white. It's easier to see because it's correcting the um, just the luminance channel. When you go to black and white, it makes it a little bit more clear. So I'm looking right here on the eye lashes. And then the masking slider tells exposures, uh, sharpening algorithm, which um, edges, or uh, yeah, which edges um, to choose to apply the sharpening effects. So that's kind of where I'd want those. And then I'll let go of the alter option button. And now I have the effect a little bit strong so I can turn it back down with the amount slider. And that's typically what I would recommend is that you would move, you know, add a lot of amount and then go back through and kind of dial in how you like the sharpening to appear on your image and then back the amount off until it's just right. Now we can hold down the backslash key to see our before and after. And it's really, really subtle, but I can see it right here on the teeth. Okay, so now we have nice and sharp image. So let's back out to fit view. That's just double clicking there. And uh, then another thing that we would do kind of when we're making some issues or corrections or anything like that is we would think about uh, the transform tools, the crop tool, uh, anything with the rotation, perspective correction, those types of things. If you have any distortion, um, and that just helps you to you know, like keep your visualization um, as you're working through or processing through your workflow. So you can uh, do it by hand just like this and make it whatever size you want. Or you can choose from one of the presets here to help you with making crops. And I feel I find that's a lot easier. Okay, cool. So with that done, I will close the crop tool. And now we have a crop and transform layer here on the top. Now I'm gonna to get to talking about this a little bit later when we're working in our overlays, uh, which that will be definitely in the creative editing section, but this will come back up later and I'll talk more about it. Okay, 
So after we've done those three things, lens correction, uh, sharpening, and any transform stuff that we wanted to do, now is when we try to think about how we're going to apply our creative edits, okay? So I've done some, I haven't actually done anything except for sharpening here. So let's pause here and add some of our basic edits on the basic editing panel. So I'm going to rename this basic. Do you see what I did there? Now we have a basic panel or a basic layer, which I will talk more about layers in a bit, but I have a basic layer so that when I apply my basic tweaks, which would probably be exposure, contrast, highlight, shadows, et cetera, I'd make here on this panel. So I'll hit auto, which intelligently places adjustments according to how I have it set up for my eye and on my computer here. Now I wanna show something that's very important with this and that's that I don't necessarily have to just work on one image in a time in exposure. And so this image right here looks a specific way. And so these uh, auto adjustments are intelligent adjustments that exposure applies to uh, the images. And so if I apply them to all of these images, then you will see that now they all do have some similarities between them, like their bright and dark values, but each image in itself is getting a unique set of changes. We can see how much exposure has been added to this image or this image. And you can see those are different. So exposure is reading the image and it's then applying adjustments based on how kind of I have them set. So if it looks, these look a little bit bright to me. So let's select all of them again. And I can make adjustments to the automatic adjustments right here inside of this little menu. I can select these four lines. Inside this menu, I can say, well, it looks a little bright. That would be my exposure bias saying a little bit bright. So let's bring it down to not quite as bright. And then I'll just hit auto again. And then it'll make the adjustment to my auto corrections. Now, typically you don't have to go back in your auto corrections and make adjustments. This is just what I like. This is typically what I put on my images. That's what I like. So once you do that to your uh, liking on your machine, you won't have to continue to do that. Maybe a little update now and again, but not very much. Backlit photos uh, along with um, bright photos, it's, it's going to have some different effects. So you might have to go back in and make a little bit of tweak here and there, you know, to make it look like the way that you'd want it to. Now, I just wanted to show that you can apply a bunch of effects to a bunch of images and exposure very quickly. And uh, the auto adjustments is one of those things that's really handy. So as we're editing now, let's also talk about how we can do some, well, really quick looks in editing. So I've done some basic adjustments on these images already. And let's talk about presets. Presets are looks inside of exposure that, um, well, they will apply a specific look. And so let's get a cute shot here I like this. Okay, so uh, they're organized into folders. Here's you can look through them with me. They have black and white presets and color presets. There's tons of different ones. As we open them up, we can see the preview thumbnails here over on the left in the panel. And as you hover over them, they will apply to the image in the preview in the big image in the middle. So you can see what these different looks will uh, appear like on the image, All right? So let's go to color. Now there are a couple of here to point out. I like the cinema ones when I'm trying to find a mood. So this is just something that I do. Uh, if you have something that you're trying to show some really unique poppy color, I like these Technicolor looks, especially with like old cars. I love these Technicolor looks. This is just personal taste, but that's up to you. Uh, these Polaroid looks are really neat, but I always, I'm very weary about putting a cyan tone on skin as it can kind of look, make people look a little sickly. But so if I'm doing some edits to portraits, I will typically look inside of the color films, print and color films, low contrast categories. Uh, these categories are, well, film looks. The, these are uh, actual films here inside of exposure. And then as you hover down them, you can see as it updates, they're very subtle. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit here. They are very subtle as they apply to this uh, image here. And so these like Kodak portrait were actually made from Kodak for portraits. 
maybe they ran out of letters and it should have been Kodak portrait and someone misspelled it. But anyway, uh, if you apply it, this is a low contrast version. You can see that it gives it just a little uh, bright and glow. And you can see that the little boy here, you can see like all that little peach fuzz that little kids have. And it really picks up on that. I think it's a cute way to uh, give a look to an image like this really quick. Now we did apply some edits on the basic panel, right? Those were the auto adjustments, okay? Those are the ones we did there. But after I click that and put uh, the portrait preset on there, you notice that there's also some action happening here in um, the tools panel. So, or on the bottom here, where we can see the color, tone curve, vignette, overlays, and grain panel have all have some edits applied to them. That's what these little circles mean right here. If you click that, that means it's gonna reset this panel, which was used to create the preset right here that we applied, minus the auto adjustments, which was separate. This is a different ball of wax right here. These are not connected to the presets, okay? So it says that it's in a layer. So I just wanna point out something really fast that these presets are not just say all end all. You can also find more creative ones, like even some of these, let's zoom back out here, graduated filters or whatever, where you want to apply maybe a look that has a color wash like this. That looks great. And uh, I don't have to just put it in its own layer. I can apply it in its a new layer just by grabbing a hold of it, dragging it up right here to where it says add layer. And bam, now I have my Kodak Portra and my color wash orange layers happen at the same time to the image. See, I can turn them off and on individually. Now I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I did want to show that there's a lot of functionality just in these creative presets alone where you can mix and blend them together and create some really unique looks that you couldn't find anywhere else. So the presets, uh, there's also some cheat codes to the presets. And what I mean by that is you can search right in here. If you have a look in mind, or if you know that there's something that you really like, um, so I really like Tri-X, so I, I'll just type in, oh, I'm in color. <laughs> Tri-X is a black and white film. All there. And then uh, and you can see like all of those black and white options come up. So this is where I would go all the time would be Tri-X. Or if you know that you have a, um, a certain um, black and white look, you can put Portra in here if you're going to look for Portra, or if you have a Fuji camera, or if you want to shoot a Fuji film, or create a Fuji look, you can type that in. There's a whole bunch of creative options here. And uh, yeah, really, really cool ones. Now, if you do find some that you like, you can mark them as a star or favorite is what that is. And then you can go to your favorites panel here or menu and look through which ones you really, really like using all the time. So that kind of narrows it down so you don't have hundreds to dig through if it is that you're going to use presets. Also, of course, you can make your own presets with all of the different stuff that I'm going to cover here in the next couple of minutes. So now that we've talked about how we can apply presets, these are predefined looks that you can apply to your images with one click. I'm going to close this panel and let's move on to making some other um, edits. So I'm going to delete that layer because that was going to confuse us. Okay. So we're back to this layer with all these edits on it. You can see them right here. I pointed those out earlier. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me check my notes one quick time here to make sure that I have everything ready to go. And I'm pretty, pretty good. Okay. So we talked about, oh man, allergies. We did talk about allergies and I'm glad we did. We talked about um, crop and transforms. So that's right here, okay? I have, there's also a spot heal tool and, bam, there it is. And a clone tool, oops, that's not what I meant to do. Here we go, spot heal tool. I'm gonna hold the space bar and you can see that it uh, turns the cursor to a hand. If I hold the space bar, then I can click and move around in the image. A lot of the time when I'm doing a demo, I forget to tell people what I'm doing. So uh, yeah, I'm a bad guy. Anyway, heal brush, that's going to take away like little blemishes or things like this where we don't really have to you know, fix or think about them very much. Uh, we can also make a lot of changes to uh, an image here. Oh, it looks like I have her eyebrow. That's why it's weird. There we go. 
And then uh, we can also make changes after we make our little spot here in the UI. We can change that spot by making it larger or um, less opaque, you know, take it down a little bit so that some of that color shows through. I think it's fruit or watermelon or something. But anyway, so, uh, and yeah, we can take the feathering on the edges down so that it fills it in a little bit more. It's up to you. Also, there is a clone mode right here in this brush tool or spot heel tool, which is better for, let's see if we have a good spot here. It's better for if we're doing some replacement on, let's zoom in here. Like in the hair, you see where there's textures right here. So if we use the heel mode, that's gonna try to blend these together, right? And we can see that's kind of a muddy mess. Whereas if we turn that to clone mode and we know we want it to be more sharp on those edges, that's gonna give us a better overall look to what we're trying to do. Now, this is not a very good example because it's not a real case scenario, but the brush tool is automatic. Uh, the spot heel tool rather is automatic. So I'm gonna set it back to heel mode and we can see that there's just a little spot right here. And uh, yeah, it's, it's gonna automatically grab and we can see that it's just very faint right around there is where it grabbed that spot. Now it's gonna do that automatically and it typically nails it most of the time, but if you want to, you can move that to another place. Like when it there, if I pick up the eyebrow or the eyelash, you can see it's dark. Obviously I don't want that. And so I can move it over to another place there to uh, re, um, remove that spot. Okay. Now let's zoom back out. All right. Now uh, let's talk about, we talked about the basic panel. At, so let's talk about color, which is a great way of adding a bunch of different effects to an image quickly. Let me select another image here. Uh, this one's cute. All right. So in color, we have some color filters, which if you're using black and white photography and you've done black and white photography with film and a dark room, then you'll know what color filters are. And they're just essentially pieces of glass that you put over the end of the lens. And in black and white photography, that helps to bring uh, tension or uh, brightness or more contrast to certain tones. But in color photography, it adds tones. So you can uh, choose presets here from the list, or you can add your own, whatever tone you would like, or just a quick touch to make something appear a little bit more cool or a little bit more warm. And now since this is a little little cherub here, a little baby, I will make it more warm because you don't want a baby to look cold, I, I would think. Anyway, so let's talk down, well, let's move down in the panel here to the HSL. That's hue, saturation, and luminance, okay? I have it in compact mode. If you don't have it in compact mode, it's a little more scrolling. So I'm just gonna put it back to compact, okay? So uh, let's talk about hue. When would you use these tools? Well, for instance, the little baby here has some pink in her toes and her cheeks. The rest of her looks pretty good, but there is some pink, okay? So what I'm gonna say is I wanna grab this pink tone and I wanna make it more like this orange pink tone. It's a really good use actually, or a case of it for this, okay? So let's zoom in a little bit here. Uh, and so in, I can drag my, let's say red, because typically that looks like a pink to me. So I can drag this slider, make it more orange. And then you can see that it took that pink away in the image. Now it also did flatten that tone out a little bit. So another way to do that is to, instead of fiddling with each one of these sliders individually, I can use the uh, color selector tool, which is right here. So if I go over here to the pink middle tone right here in the baby's hand, I wanna grab that. And if I drag up, we can see it's doing a little adjustment there. Now it's only giving me one tone, so this is not a very good example. Let's find another one. Well, anyway, I'm gonna drag that up to get rid of that pink, right? Now let's go to, uh, I'm gonna click out of that tool. 
Now let's take a look here. Let's go to saturation. Okay. Same, almost the exact same set of sliders here, which enable us to make controls or make edits to each one of these different sections or, or uh, values of this photo. So I'm going to do with saturation. Okay. So in saturation, I can see this dad has a tattoo right here. So I'm, Again, instead of grabbing a hold of just the cyans and dragging them up, which didn't do anything, let's go with the selector tool and I'll grab a hold of it and then drag that up. Oh, there, that's why. So you can see that there's a greens and cyans are being uh, edited here as I grab a hold and drag the um, saturation for that tattoo up. So that does make it pop a little bit more. So let's go to luminance. And then do the same thing, but let's take that blue down, make it a little darker. Okay. So you can see the same things happening. Yes, the greens and cyans are being impacted there. Okay. So uh, anyway, in the color panel, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do that gives you a, a wide range of editing abilities um, to make adjustments to your images in exposure. So. It's a little bit there. Let's talk. Let's move on to the tone curve panel. Uh, tone curve is another way that you can adjust or make adjustments to your images in exposure. This is just a, another, uh, actually it enables you to do a whole bunch of other things uh, in different ways. So there are presets here at the top that do some um, common things that people like to do. You can just brighten the highlights a little bit, or you can crush the blacks, which means that you don't really have any deep grays. We can uh, make it under or overexposed, give it a landscape look, or even this cool like milky blacks look where if I select, if I click off and back on there, where it adds just a little bit of fall off on that, uh, on that shadow there. So if I turn the panel off and back on, you can see how it updates the preview there. So whenever I'm working in a panel and exposure, make a couple of tweaks, turn it off, see what it's doing, turn it back on, make sure you're on point. Okay, so if you're in at home in the curve editor in exposure then, or in a Photoshop or wherever you've worked previously, then you'll be right at home here because this works just like that curve editor. You can grab a hold of a point and manipulate that line, however you'd like to, to apply the curve. Uh, you can also use the sliders down below, which gives you a little bit of a cheat mode when creating or making some edits here in exposure, just like that. Now remember we said milky blacks. And so the black point has been raised. You can see here on the edge. So if I wanted to undo that, I can bring it back down, but that's not quite right. So I'll command Z and undo that. There we go. Um, we can also add split toning down here below. Split toning is something that's typical, uh, typically noticeable in black and white photography, but, uh, but it's used in color photography too. So if you have a black and white image, you can choose a different mixture of tones to add to a black and white image or even some for color. Now, these have been made specifically for color, whereas the other ones are made for black and white. And that's probably why these ones are much more strong or apply a much stronger effect. So if I wanted to just apply a look like that, uh, cyan and um, what is that? Orange and teal almost. Um, I can make adjustments to, or I can make adjustments and easily customize however much I'd like here, like change the color if I wanted, or make it not as strong, uh, anything like that. Typically when I'm doing edits and stuff like this, even when I'm doing tones, I put them on there and then I cut them in about half and then move away from it. And then I come back if I need more later. All right. So now we're kind of getting into our creative effects now, which is a really fun point to be at. Um, so let's go to another shot here. <laughs> this is cute. All right, I'm going to crop this one down. I think it's funny. Let's do five by seven. I want it to be really close. Okay, so uh, we have the crop and transform layer and that's, I'm gonna get back to that, okay? But we're talking about creative stuff. So one of the creative things that we can do to draw attention to the subject in exposure is to add a vignette. 
So we can add a vignette quickly. Now, inside of Exposure, I did want to point out something about working with Crop and Transform. And that is that I did the carnal thing that I said I wasn't going to do and put creative effects under this Crop and Transform layer. So I made a new layer here, and that's going to be my rename effects. Okay. So I'm going to add my vignette back in there. Bam. There we go. Now, I can choose where I want the center of that vignette to be and make some adjustments to these sliders. Typically, when I'm pl placing a vignette inside of Exposure, is I take the amount and crank it all the way up. And then I take the softness all the way down. That gives me a very hard outline. If you ever worked in a dark room, you will have plenty of these laying around where you have an oblong looking hole in a sheet and you're ready to shake it around and make it soft however you'd like to. But if we want to offset how our hole is in our developing sheet, we can with the size of lumps and then the amount that that lump applies to the uh, shape. So if we take the lump distortion out, then we have more of an oval shape, crank it all the way up, and then we have a whatever shape that is. So you can play around with this as much as you like. You can get a ton of different looks inside of exposure with this. And after you kind of come up with, I'm going to hit random seed, which randomly applies those lumps again. There we go. You should always try adding that as a couple of times whenever you're uh, making a new vignette and exposure, but Okay, I've hit random seed a couple of times. Now I have an oblong look. I think that's cool. So I will add my softness back in. Right? And then I can bring my amount back down so it's more of a realistic application. So when I'm applying a vignette, I don't really want to see it after I go away and come back to the image. That's my rule. Uh, a lot of people apply things in a different way, but it's just just my personal taste again. So that's a quick way to apply some uh, attention focusing effects. Speaking of focus, another way to apply focusing effects would be with focus effects. That's the wrong one. Bokeh. So Bokeh uh, is the, actually used to be its own product, but it does some really fancy blurring effects. So I'm going to choose one of these blurring. Ah, I have an idea. I'm going to choose one of these cute little our effects and then hopefully we can get some bokeh highlights in here we can see them anyway so i'm choosing what this is creating for me is uh well blur that i can control so i'm almost controlling the focus on the image in post it's really neat and easy anyway so we have a focus region that controls those blurring effects i can make that we can manipulate it to move around our image however we would like it to and we can space that effect out as well so that it only applies in a kind of a gentle cascade rather than a really harsh line of blur. Okay, so if I turn that kind of just make a little softness here, it brings the attention up here a little bit more. So this is definitely an option to add some more uh, uh, focus or attention grabbing um, well, this will add more focus, which is attention grabbing. That's where I was going. Anyway, and tons of options inside of this. Now, we do have videos that talk about all of these things in particular on our website. And so I wanted to point that out as I'm going through them rather quickly in this demo. I'm just touching on what opportunities you have. Grain is another great thing. That's an opportunity for you to add an analog or uh, made by hand look to an image. The grain controls and exposure are second and none. Uh, you can't, I'll, I'll show you exactly what I mean. Uh, so I'll just choose from one of the presets here at the top of the grain panel. And let's zoom in. There we go. So we can see all of the, I want to find a bunch of different, like, it's so cute. Her face is so cute. Uh, I want to see a bunch of different tones here. So we have some bright tones and some dark stuff. Nice, nice contrast sharpness. There's some black here. So uh, as we look through this, then I can make adjustments to where I want the strength of the grain to apply in exposure. And so I don't really care to see a bunch of the grain in the mid tones because I think it kind of looks like noise. And so uh, I'll take that out typically. 
but I will put some in highlights because I think that helps, especially if you have like blown out areas, it'll add a little bit of detail there. Okay. And then I will also, I like it in the shadows. So I will, you can see it right here. I'll turn it off. Watch right here. I'll turn that back on. Bam. So I like the look of that. That's just nice to me. But you have full control over it in exposure, however you'd like to. There's also presets, which I showed you at the beginning. And what I meant by also presets, if you select presets oops, over here on the in the presets panel, like, for example, well, I think any of these, this one, you can see just there, um, check it out. You can see the grain when I just hover over that preset, okay? So there are grain effects included in these presets over here in the presets panel. Now, I think that looks awesome. So I'm gonna close that and we'll talk more about something else moving on here. Overlays, now, overlays, I'm going to add a new layer for overlays and then we'll rename that layer because we're going to talk about layers too. So overlays are attention getting things, not really attention getting things. They're effects that you can put over the top of your images that can add some depth and some interest, especially when they're needed. Um, so if you have a shot and you want to apply like a border effect, right? Or a look like this, like make it an old fashioned photo. You can do that easily here with different borders. Now, there are tons of different kinds of borders inside of exposure and a whole bunch of different varieties, right? So sometimes if you don't know quite what you want to do, you can randomize those border effects and just see what each one does. So if you're not a fan of border effects, I think they're cute. Sometimes they work really well. I think this image is one of those that looks very vintage in the first place. So I think any of these would really work. Uh, Let's not do the border. Let's try a light effect overlay. So a lot of these light effects come from, you know, light actually getting into your camera, like low fi little plastic ca cameras and stuff. Uh, there's also some really neat, weird stuff that we've put in here too, like some hazy looks. Or we can even put some tone like um, the, from the sunrise here is a blur map. Uh, we can put a bunch of different colors and things like that. There's also some things like uh, from slides or from, um, well, that would be like, that would be a light leak that would came in through the edge of the camera. But these are typical things that would happen in like um, Diana or lo-fi shots. There's a whole bunch of options for what we could use here. And after you say place something like this, let's find a, uh... here we go. Okay, so after you place one on your image, you can control where it is. You can, you know, manipulate it, make some changes to how it affects that shot. You can change to a different blend mode if you like a different look to what you're placing on there. That looks really bizarre. It looks like she has a, has a burn victim now. Right? There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do to uh, apply effects. Yeah, that's weird. So that doesn't work on that image. Let's go to screen lighter. There we go. And um, we can also protect a location, let's say, down at the bottom of this panel. We can say that we don't want to apply to that area where I just selected here in the middle of the photo. And then as we drag out, it will block that area of the photo from being a hit with that effect. Now, as you get more subtle with these, they become very, very interesting and um, very uh, helpful or useful, especially in the right conditions. So the opacity of this is really strong, in my opinion. So usually when I use overlays and things like that, I'm always bringing the opacity down. But after you have it placed, you have control here over the opacity. And if you would like, you can add more uh, of a texture to it. So we'll add more of a texture to it, right? And then uh, we can make this overlay appear the way that we want it to on the photo. There we go. Okay. And then we also have, instead of just the opacity here and here, we can also control the layer opacity here. 
which is all of the edits that we have applied on this layer. Now, remember how I pointed out that we had all of these edits that were made to the bottom layer. Oh, that was on a different image. Here we go. We can see these effects. <laughs> so we have these effects that we've applied to this image, right? On the vignette layer, grain layer, and a bokeh layer. And so we can control the grain, the vignette, and bokeh all at the same time by lowering the opacity here if we didn't like it. Or if we had it down here, we raised it so we see more or have more opacity. Now I want you to notice that these thumbnails here, these are called the layer masks. These thumbnails are changing color as I edit them. So see how it gets darker? That's showing me how much of that effect or how much of that layer effect I will see applied to the image. Now, there are a whole bunch of different ways that you can control where the effects apply in your images in exposure or to your images in exposure. So here's what I'm going to do. I'll go back to that layer and I want these effects to be strong so that we can see how strong they are. Okay, so now if I turn the layer off and I turn it back on, we can see that we are making this much brighter. So what we're going to do is I want to control where this effect, where this layer effect is applying, being applied to the image. And I have a number of ways to do that. Okay, I can make a, I can brush a section here with control of a brush to say I only want the effects to apply to this area here and it gives me the control to brush in that effect very quickly and easily or I can add a gradient which gives me control for making seamless natural fades come on there we go just like with the bokeh tools, you will remember that I was using something very similar to this. But you can also see how the, uh, the layer mask thumbnails being updated as I, uh, as I manipulate these tools. So this is the application of this has a nice smooth edge to it. And I can make that expanded. Okay. Okay. Another way that we can do that is using a selection. Now, there are a number of tools and a number of ways that you can make selections and exposure. You know? So um, one of the ways that we can do that is using the lasso tool. And the lasso tool makes quick selections for us. Now we can see that that's not quite the way that we wanted it to, but we're getting close. So that is the lasso tool. Right? So we want it to you know, hit our edges. Okay, so that's good enough. So now we have a quick selection here. No, that was the wrong button. There we go. Now, after you make a selection, you can always update it and make adjustments to it. And I wanted to point out that we do have tutorials, lots of tutorials on our website about using the different um, selection tools. So don't feel like I'm rushing right now, but you can do that as well. Or now I'm back to no mask. Or we can use the color constraints, which is another way of creating a mask. In this example, let me shut off this mask there. In this example, uh, a really quick way of using the uh, color constraints or a useful way is to use the hue, saturation, and luminance values to create a mask automatically. And so I would do that in this image because I want to select skin and skin tones are usually unique to in, a, in an image unless they're standing in a desert. And so all I have to do is select the eyedropper and come over and select the skin tones. And let's zoom up here so we can see the, there we go. You can see the mask there being created. Uh, that's what my selection was. And that was just without refinement. So now I can go back through and actually refine what was being selected by let's say the luminance, let's, we don't want, let's like the dark, oh, that's the wrong one. Let's say we don't want the super bright tones in the image and we can feather those out. We can also turn the mask on so we can see where we're selected. That makes it a little bit easier too, right? 
So as we make tweaks here, we can see our, uh, how our selection is being updated. And that selection being updated is also updating where our effects are going to be applied to this image, right? So what we wanted to do was find the area that was just needing a little bit of, what was it, uh, brightness and contrast. And so now with our color constraints, we have a really quick selection there, which is detailed for our effects. So our vignette, that was weird. I'll turn that off. Yeah, so our grain, our bokeh, and then we can add, well, we also have some adjustments here that we made and we can see that those are only applying to those skin tones that we have selected. Now, obviously, if you crank it really high, it's not a great look, but if you wanted to do something like brighten the skin, you can do that like this. Or if you wanted to uh, make skin look a little bit more smooth, you can take the clarity down just a little bit. Another thing that you can do to smooth skin out would be to introduce some focus, specifically blur. And so there's some presets here. We can say we wanted to use a little, dis a little softening That'll add skin smoothing right there. So we have all of these different effects being controlled by the mask that we have on our layer here. And we can control the opacity and how much those effects from that layer will affect the image on its own. Now, I brought up the crop and transform I brought up the crop and transform layer specifically. Now in the crop and transform layer, we go, if you can see when I select on the crop and transform tool that it opens crop and transform mode, right? Oops, which allows me to repurpose or reposition where my crop box is, right? So then I can close it and then it closes down the, tool or it closes down the mode and I can go back to editing. Now I said that we have overlays. So let's apply an overlay and show you a condition where you may want to have an overlay be, let's say that it's below crop and transform. Okay. So let's turn these layers off and go back to our original image. Okay, no crop applied. Now, if we want to apply our crop, we can turn it back on, but I want to show an overlay scenario where we want to have a nice strong border effect, just like this. Okay, so that is on my, let's rename that layer border. Mm-hmm. Now watch what happens. Remember we applied our crop and we moved it above this layer. Now we'll turn it on. Now what happens? Where's our border? So our border is gone and our border is gone because it's below the crop and transform layer. See what happens is exposure renders its edits or its uh, adjustments in order from bottom to top. So the adjustments that I apply here are then are first applied and then these ones and then these ones. So these crop and transform edits that I made, if I want my border, you can see it applied to the image here. If I want my border to be to snap to my new uh, crop, I just have to move it up above the crop and transform layer. And then it's going to automatically crop or it'll automatically apply to the new crop after the crop and transform layer, okay? All right, so we talked about a whole bunch of stuff, a real lot, a, a lot of things, including uh, steps through our workflow that were, I mean, how many steps do we go through here? One of those things that we do when we're working in exposure is we go back and forth, we undo stuff and we redo stuff. And that's what the history panel's for. The history panel remembers all the things that you did inside your editing in exposure. It does that for two reasons. If you did something by mistake and say, oops, you can always go back. 
And if you did something that you'd worked on for a few minutes and then you hated what you did, you can then step back through your workflow quite a bit before you made those changes. And then you can start again and do some other stuff. Okay. So all of your steps are here in recorded. Now, all of that information here inside of our history, all of this information here that our border our overlays, our effects, the layer information, the mask information, all of that is saved in our sidecar file, remember? So inside of the Exposure X7 folder, this is a sidecar file, and that's where it's saved. So that does a couple of things for you. If you have a Dropbox folder, for example, and you want to share your edits with somebody else, if you want them to be able to make edits too so that you can receive them, you can drag your entire folder, just like this, to, let's say, your Dropbox folder, and as long as that person has that same Dropbox folder and they're synced, then you guys will, or both of you will be able to access and edit those images. So if the person on the other side makes edits to those images, then the next time that you access that folder, you will then see those image updates as well, or those editing updates as well. So... So kind of the last thing that you do when you're working inside of Exposure is get your images out of Exposure. And getting your images out of Exposure is by exporting. Remember, we only have sidecar files, so we're not actually editing the images. Okay, so when you are actually editing this part when we're exporting, those are actual edited images, which is why we're exporting them rather than saying save. So you can export them, which will give you all of the options to quickly get them out, or you can use the quick export. Quick export uh, is a little bit faster. It, it enables you to create recipes for how you're going to save your images. Like um, you want it to be, you know, 1920 by 1080, you know, for a YouTube thing, or uh, if you want it to be 3000 long because you're going to print it out, you can set that recipe up right here it says image sizing you can see these are the different presets that have been or recipes that have been saved uh, you can also save out metadata which is your information and how people can contact you or whatnot on those images uh, you can save different types of images like jpeg tiff you know etc 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 and uh, you can set up that whole recipe including how you're going to name it and where it's going to be saved on your computer and then in exposure select all of the ones that you'd like to to export all at once. And you can see here that I have one image selected and I have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram that I'm exporting to. Now, what that's gonna do for me is export three different folders, all with images at different sizes, ready to go for those different places that I have them saved. So that's kind of a benefit to using the, uh, to using the um, quick export. So I think that that concludes our demonstration. We did a whole bunch of stuff today in a very little amount of time. And uh, despite that not everybody was pleased with it, I'm, I'm certainly glad that you all stayed for the demonstration today. Um, let me give you a couple of outgoing or closing remarks, and then we'll head over to take care of our Q&A time. A lot of people love to or get in contact with other exposure users to kind of kick around different things that they do and, some, and get some pro tips. That's a good way to do that is to get in hold of the exposure user group right here over on Facebook. And uh, it's a great place. They to um, share what you've made with Exposure, to uh, share some tips and tricks with other Exposure users and not to ask tech support questions because sometimes tech support questions um, are best answered by us. So we just ask that you reach out to us for that. Now, another place that you can share what you're creating inside of Exposure is in the Exposure users group. I mean, uh, I just said that, is by posting to Instagram with our hashtag my exposure edit uh, my, this is what we watch to uh, see what people are creating with our software 
And there's so much great talent out there. So please tag us with your shares over there if you want to share them with us. So thank you guys all very much for uh, tuning in today. 